Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on your time zone. Uh, welcome to the third and the last webinar of the Blue Justice Conference. My name is Lida Dochi, and uh, I'm a program officer at the UNODC Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime. Uh, today's webinar will focus on how UNODC is supporting member states in tackling fisheries crime through hands-on activities in the field um, via three uh, global programs at UNODC, the Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime, the UNODC WCO Container Control Program, and the Global Maritime Crime Program. These three programs work together in a comprehensive UNODC approach to tackling fisheries crime, and each has a specific focus area of technical assistance. Um, first, before uh, starting with, uh, with the content and the presentations, I would like to ask uh, all participants to post their questions in the Q&A uh, section uh, in the Zoom chat, uh, so we can address them afterwards in the time allocated for discussion. Uh, in order to allow sufficient time for the discussion, I kindly ask the speakers to keep the presentations to 10 minutes. Allow me to start by uh, saying a few words about the UNODC approach on uh, fisheries crime. UNODC derives its mandate to work in this area from a series of General Assembly resolutions dating back to 2009 concerning the nexus between international organized crime and illegal fishing, as well as various resolutions of the Commission on Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice. So what are we talking about when we talk about fisheries crime from a UNODC perspective? And what is the mandate of UNODC? As a guardian of the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime and the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNODC plays a key role in supporting member states addressing fisheries crime. In our approach, fisheries crime cover a broad range of illegal activities that may occur at one or more stages of the value chain. These offenses have generally three characteristics. They are different to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, although they very often occur at the same time um, with IEU fishing and are very often related to it. Um, these activities may or may not be directly linked to the fishing operations, and uh, I'll explain the, the way we categorize uh, the different, uh, different offenses based uh, on this criteria. Um, and also, these offenses very frequently meet the criteria for the UNCAC and the UNTOC to apply. UNODC divides fisheries crime into two categories. Uh, first, we have the crimes associated with the fisheries sector. They do not have a direct connection with the fishing operations, but do take place on fishing vessels, or in the fishing facilities, or sometimes uh, they use fishing operations to commit or to cover other crimes. Um, examples of these crimes are um, trafficking of firearms, for example, or trafficking in persons using fishing vessels. Uh, the second subcategory uh, are the crimes in the fisheries value chain. These crimes are closely linked to the fishing operations, although they are not illegal fishing per se. They do extend to the trade, to the ownership structures, and the financial services associated with the fishing sector. They are not only associated with the act of fishing. Such crimes do include corruption, money laundering, tax crimes, customs, and fiscal fraud. Through the presentations of our expert panel today, you will hear more on the different areas of technical assistance that UNODC provides to member states in tackling these crimes. The first speaker, um, Mr. Kevin Pretorius, will provide an example of one of the areas provided uh, by the Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime. The Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime assists member states in addressing wildlife, forest, and fisheries crime, from crime scene to court. It works closely with 30 member states across Africa, Asia, Latin America, and South Pacific. The program provides direct support to law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, wildlife, forest, and fisheries authorities, and other partners to improve national, regional, and international criminal justice and preventive responses. 
In the area of fisheries crime, the global program works with member states to address crimes in the fisheries value chain, including fraud, forgery, corruption, and tax crimes. The program does so in collaboration with other uh, UNODC offices and sections in-house, such as, for example, the UNODC Corruption and Economic Crime Branch and the UNODC Organized Crime Branch. All this work is conducted in close partnership with the Food and Agriculture Organization as the lead UN agency with a mandate on addressing IEU fishing. The program bases technical assistance in a value chain approach uh, and identifies possible entry points for different types of crimes. Adopting a value chain approach does on the one hand identify the numerous points at, along the fisheries value chain at which different types of criminal offenses occur. And it also highlights potential entry points for law enforcement intervention in identifying, investigating and prosecuting crimes throughout the sector. I now have the privilege to introduce Mr. Kevin Pretorius, um, who will present on one specific area of capacity building of the program, the trainings for investigators and prosecutors on crimes in the fisheries value chain. The assistance has so far been provided through the Justice for Fish seminars that took place in September 2018 in Vienna and September 2019 in Nairobi. Mr. Pretorius is a practicing attorney of the High Court of South Africa based in Durban. He's a member of the South African legal practice um, specializing in uh, criminal and environmental law. He has 32 years of litigation experience, uh, which includes senior prosecutor prosecuting high profile environmental cases. He has acted as a specialist legal environmental advisor and consultant for international as well as South African public and private environmental agencies. Kevin, you have the screen. Thank you so much, Leida. Thank you so much, Leida. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the UNODC. It is a great privilege and honor to speak to you all, all the participants, wherever you may be, and from a very sunny and, and, and warm Durban in South Africa on the East Coast. And um, as, as a, a, a person that has been dealing with uh, prosecution of these type of offenses, um, when I was prosecuting as a senior prosecutor in Durban, and also in a large part of my litigation career, I have taken um, a lot of what Leda said and the, the programs of UNODC and, and seen how massive this value is for the prosecutors that I do come across um, in my country as well as those that are, are there internationally that I interact with when I do go and assist um, the, the UNODC in its program. The, I was so privileged to be part of the justice, one of the seminars, the Justice for Fishing Training for Investigators and Prosecutors and Crime Scene in the Value Chain in Nairobi. So I'm going to be spending a minute or two um, on that, on the second part of the point of, of my presentation. And the first part, I'm going to be uh, talking really from the perspective of um, the prosecutors training and uh, the, the perspective in South Africa and the value that the prosecutor and the investigator gets from these seminars and from the various technical tools and assist and, uh, that, that the UNODC has and um, which I've seen and uh, gained great value from. Now, as a prosecutor, sometimes we expect them just to know the law. So when they get cases in a criminal court, they, um, the investigator will bring the case and say, right, here it is, off you go with the charges. You, you are the lawyer for, for the, the complainant in the case, off you go. Uh, forgetting that, that the statutory offenses nationally um, often are intricate, and we've got to understand exactly the different ancillary crimes that may happen. Now, Leda has spoken to the value chain approach, which I found so, so such a good explanation in, in, in the way that the UNODC is, is approaching the technical assistance, because you need to understand the holistic approach, which for us is that crime seem to court, 
And that whole value chain starting right in the beginning where you are preparing to fish and goes right through those six stages right to the consumer. And also then the overlapping uh, where you have your IU fishing charge, your, your, your charges where there are specific fishing offenses, or there may be those of human trafficking and drug smuggling or arms smuggling, which also forms part. Now, the, the great value of this, this, these, these seminars is that the participants are seeing that full process and how this fisheries crime is an economic crime uh, in that country. So that is why for us here and in dealing with the capacity building of prosecutors here or when I go to court in a mentorship role, I then refer to this value chain in, in fisheries and how they need to see those offenses and they need to guide the investigators who may not know in that process. And in the same way, understanding how to prove the offenses and um, when it's a prosecutor guided uh, prosec uh, uh, investigation to be able to highlight that value chain um, all along the way that we might have the fraud, the corruption, the, the tax evasion. There are so many of those economic crimes which need to be built in as well. The other aspect that I find in dealing with prosecutors is often because they don't understand how the, the fisheries management and how the fisheries sector works, they are often not confident to understand this, this approach and therefore not often uh, knowing that there are so many, there are so many different offenses which we can look at and we can, we can put all of them there as long as we're pro pro proving the link between the offense and the perpetrator. And this becomes very important when you're more specialized and experienced prosecutors are starting to lead the investigators in prosecutor-led uh, or, or uh, investigations because then you need to be able to see this approach as such. Now, this Justice for Fish, these seminars, um, which form part of the, uh, the UNODC's Fishnet program and which is funded by the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, has such value because the prosecutors there are, and you can see in the photograph, there were 28 prosecutors uh, in Nairobi on the 4th to 6th September 2019 in this seminar. And they were from 11 countries, from Africa and Asia and the Indian Ocean region. And they could actually gain great experience through those facilitators and trainers who were present. So the aim of this seminar uh, was to follow up on the first training workshop that was held in uh, Vienna in 3 to 6 September 2018. And the other aim being raising the awareness on the relevance of the value chain approach. Now, Leida has already spoken of that, that this is a vital approach and we as those that go to court if, if prosecutors can see this approach when they are dealing with their case in court or when they're leading an investigation is going to have great value. The other aim in, in the seminar was to understand the challenges that are faced by, when, by participating when, when performing their duties. Uh, they, could give, they could give feedback to us and, um, and there was a great debate between the different prosecutors and investigators about challenge that they may have in their country. And then further the networking, I was fantastic between the different professionals and exchanging of ideas and, and how to, to solve the challenges they may have. Let's go to the screen of the benefits that Leida has already mentioned as regards um, the prosecutor understanding for his country and his jurisdiction this value chain approach. Now, the economic crimes I've mentioned um, are, are something which may, may be highlighted and many, some of the countries didn't see, uh, hadn't seen this approach before in, in terms of what the prosecutors have given us feedback. And this, this approach often, if it's land-based, you can see we don't have those issues around um, various jurisdictions, which makes it easier, easier for our litig litigators. Um, 
in terms of corruption and tax crime and money laundering, very important for us is to get admissible evidence to link the accused, each of them, to a crime. And documentary uh, documents is a valuable form of evidence. And obviously, following the money assists us uh, immensely. And this way, the using this type, this econ these economic crimes where you're looking and focusing at that value chain, you then will be able to uh, investigate bank records, you'll be able to see the bill of ladings, you're going to be able to see all the purchase orders, and they are very important for us, and they form a very important part of our case. Also, in, depending on the jurisdictions you're going to cover, you'll find in some of those jurisdictions that you will be able to look at the penalty and sanction provisions and may be able to say, well, you know, we, we, we need to focus on that jurisdiction because we are going to get a good sanction and good sentence, which is always important for us because of the rehabilitative effect and the sanction um, when, when it comes to these perpetrators. The other important aspect, and it's a very important aspect that I see um, all over, is that corruption uh, it plays a part in the whole value chain in terms of these crimes. And the quicker we can spot that, the quicker we can look at it, because those are the facilitators, and they are sometimes the more difficult charges, and they, they, they often overlooked, and prosecutors, in, in terms of this seminar, there was a great, uh, uh, and, and my colleagues who were facilitating were at great pains to show them how this, these, these crimes are then facilitated through corruption and the whole corruption uh, net chain. So looking at the overview of when the, the, the participants actually started giving us feedback, we've already said that they, the, the challenge that they had was that Many of them didn't have special prosecutors who, who had the expertise to prosecute these cases, and also those that deal with environmental cases. Secondly, second of all, we've spoken and we've highlighted that some of these countries didn't see this, these fisheries crime along the value chain as economic crimes. But through our interaction, these stakeholders and these participate, participants could go back and actually um, highlight this to, to, their, to their countries. There were also, uh, there was limited interagency uh, inter cooperation with their countries between the agencies who have the mandate to deal with this, whether it's the police, the customs, um, and the various financial institutions, but not only internally, but there seemed to be there seem to be issues around that mutual legal assistance, and that was highlighted as an issue which, which we need to be able to deal with because these offenses can stretch across all these jurisdictions. Now, my colleagues that were facilitating and training were very experienced, and they could give recommendations to these countries and the prosecutors and investigators in how to deal with this approach. And, uh, I, the, my very experienced colleague uh, from New York, Marcus Asner, showed a case or had a case study which was one of the, the biggest mutual legal assistance cases between South Africa and the US um, around a fishery case, the, the uh, Heart Bay Fishing Benjes case, which um, was really um, a great example of mutual legal assistance where the convictions that resulted were, were, were really welcomed in one of the biggest cases that we've dealt with here from our side and with the assistance obviously of the US and their prosecution there and obviously the commensurate penalties and the proceeds of crime the, that, and the seizure of, of, of those assets and the funds that, that are being returned to South Africa. All right, so if we look at the recommendations that came from from this um, from the seminar, which was very important for uh, the prosecutors to take as a as a takeaway from the seminar, and certainly which I took back to my country was very importantly as highlighted the corruption and other economic crimes along the value chain that prosecutors have to know and have a good knowledge of the various offences. They need to 
um, understand in their countries how the fishing sector and this value chain is set up so that when you are leading a prosecution or when you are dealing with the leading of evidence linking accused, this can be done effectively. Also, when you're now dealing with it in proactive investigations, don't just, don't just wait for the, the offence to happen. Sometimes through inf information, we can use investigative tools and you'll see my next point and techniques like undercover operations, um, the, the, the uh, looking at various uh, social media networks through uh, and also communication networks to be able to get admissible evidence, obviously in, in the legal process that, that, your, that your country allows. And then very importantly, we need to be unified in fighting this offence. And that's why you need to be able to engage with other jurisdictions um, as early as possible, as it happened with um, the US, and I, and I wish to compliment um, all of those involved, including my colleague, uh, Mr. Asner, for, for that, uh, that case. And it serves as a great precedent for us all in how the two countries assisted in fighting, in fighting this crime. So the UNODC and us as presenters took away some very important key points, uh, which were outcomes and this is the continuous awareness raising in, in the efforts to, to look at this um, value chain approach that uh, the prosecutors and investigators have in dealing with fisheries crime and how to look at those crimes and find the admissible evidence along the value chain. And this came across as well, uh, interestingly, where the participants were given a desktop study by uh, Mr. Aston was facilitating that, that and, uh, and, and it, it, there, the, uh, the, the, the whole chain and how the documents and the fraud and forgery uh, could be looked at and the, and the participants could then look and actually for themselves understand the principles that had been brought through um, by the, the, the various trainers in the early days of the workshop. And the other takeaway was that we need to strengthen the capacity of all stakeholders, but not just the prosecutors, investigators, but all of those that may be dealing with the enforcement uh, process from crime scene to court. And then to let the prosecutors not just look at a very staid approach with blinkers on when dealing with these offences, and that, as later said, those, those triumvirate of ancillary offences, fisheries crime and IUU, where they all meet together, there's a whole basket of offenses which we must look at and not just look and stare at one or two of the charges and think, well, you know, this is what we must deal with. Have a look at this approach because very importantly, you're going to find the economic crimes, the documents that go with it and the corruption. Now, the conclusions here that can be taken um, from from the experience that I had or have already in South Africa as a litigator, as a trainer with prosecutors and investigators, and which I've dedicated a large part of my career to, um, and also in dealing with the UNODC's uh, program and seminars, is that prosecutors need to look critically at their legislation. And we could hear in our interactions with the participants that there was the need for them to look at and learn from others who may have uh, procedures in undercover operations which aren't in legislation in their countries, or asset forfeiture, or proceeds of crime, or how to deal with mutual legal assistance. And this is the way we need to tackle um, the fisheries crime. They also, uh, prosecutors need to look at their foreign counterparts and um, be able to learn and be able to see examples and be able to interact with all of these tools that are there. And the UNODC provides those platforms and that material for them to be able to learn. It's just then a matter of implementing them into your country and reaching out to the UNODC and its experts where there are these technical assessment tools. Now, a tool that, that really worked very well is this technical assistance um, that you will see in the Rotten Fish Guide, which is published by the UNODC. And there, there's a, a tool that was highlighted during the seminar and how to do a risk assessment 
in terms of these economic crimes and how you will then go about the stages of looking um, and making this assessment in, in country and then being able to work out the mitigation plan as to where are the vulnerable areas which you need to mitigate against where you are going to get the corruption and where you may get the offenses. Now, these tools are there and countries and prosecutors and, and were very excited about looking at them. And I, I, I urge everyone who doesn't have this guide to please get hold of the UNODC and Leda and her team, because that certainly for, for us here is, is a great guide. Also then, uh, I know that the UNODC has got, and I urge the prosecutors and the investigators uh, to look at the rapid reference guides and the standard operating procedures that have been published for various countries. And I think there's the latest one in Kenya that refers to the, the, marine, the, 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 the marine crimes, marine offenses, and obviously looking at the, the, the fish, fish, uh, fisheries crime. Um, these are handy for prosecutors to look at and they are rapid reference. So you can have a look very quickly to see you know, what must I do? What type of offenses must I look at when I want to go to court? And uh, I want to compliment my colleagues who've been writing on those. They are certainly handy. And in my interaction with my colleagues internationally, they often refer to, the, to, to, to these guides. So I think in, in the 10 minutes, and I, I'm afraid I might have gone over uh, later, but um, I was very excited to speak to all of you and thank you, UNODC, for the opportunity. And um, certainly I'll be able to take uh, some questions later if there are, but um, th this was a great opportunity and I hope um, we, we can uh, all uh, stand together to fight fisheries crime. Thank you, Leda. Thank you very much, Kevin, for your presentation and for highlighting the, the importance of uh, evidence throughout the fisheries value chain and uh, how key that is for prosecution. Um, the second presentation today will focus on the technical assistance provided by the UNODC WCO Container Control Program. The Container Control Program works with UN member states to enhance capacity in countries seeking to improve risk management, supply chain security, and trade facilitation in seaports, airports, and land border crossings in order to prevent the cross-border movement of illicit goods. With 750 million 20 foot equivalents, meaning standard cargo containers, moving around between the world's ports every year, frontline level customs and police officers have a demanding task profiling and targeting those which may contain illicit goods. The CCP works with national agencies on long-term training for such officers, ultimately resulting in the establishment of port control and air cargo control units. CCP currently has 120 operational units in 60 countries, covering all regions in the world. I now get to introduce Mr. Svetlan Savo, who is the technical expert for the Container Control Program. Prior to joining UNODC, Svetlan worked 20 years in Bulgarian customs and held several high-ranked positions such as Head of Customs Intelligence, Deputy Head of Customs, and Head of the Varna uh, uh, Customs, as well as the Director of the Regional Customs Directorate in Varna. He also worked as an advisor under the EU Border Assistance Mission in Moldova and Ukraine. His presentation will follow on CCP's work on fisheries crime in the containerized trade supply chain using concrete examples of work and results. We are also very pleased to have Mr. Ivan Kagambo on the line. He is a port control unit leader in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, participating. Um, Ivan will also be available to respond to any questions during the Q&A section. Svetlan, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leda, for your kind words. And also thank you for uh, inviting me here as a guest uh, speaker. It's an honor and a uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, in addition to what you've just uh, said, I need to mention that, uh, you know, to resign from customs after 20 years uh, of service, it was uh, perhaps one of the most uh, difficult decisions in my life. But uh, since that uh, moment, I've never regretted for, uh, you know, my decision to join a container, container control uh, program. Uh, let me share my screen now. And because uh, I'm really struggling with, uh, with my internet, 
uh, as soon as it's on the screen, maybe I'll need to I'll need to switch off my my camera. Can you see my presentation on the screen? We can. Okay. You know, I'm trying to enlarge it. I believe now it's. Uh, is it enlarged? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so uh, first of all, why a container, why container control uh, program? Um, I will not uh, tell you a secret if I say that as much as 90% of the world's cargo nowadays is um, uh, containerized. And as uh, it has been already previously uh, mentioned, the exact figure is uh, more than 800 million containers. Uh, container movements are registered uh, globally uh, every year. Uh, now, this increased uh, participation in uh, this growing international trade is a priority for many countries, especially for especially for the developing uh, developing countries. And uh, uh, it often comes at the expense uh, expense of uh, security. Today, this is the statistics uh, in the customs only. Uh, two percent, I would say, even less than two percent of this uh, eight uh, hundred uh, million containers are physically, uh, physically inspected in the in the container in the container ports. Or, yeah. Uh, in addition, uh, simply many countries they don't have the capacity and the knowledge to to establish uh, effective security measures at their uh, container ports. Uh, and it's not only the ports, as uh, it's been already uh, said, because uh, the CCP container control program works in three different directions. This is uh, sea ports, this is airports, and uh, land uh, borders. Uh, the selection and uh, inspection of uh, containers uh, have been a challenge for the law enforcement agencies for years. And uh, this um, security gap, uh, it provides ample opportunities for exploitation by the organized crime. They're using uh, sophisticated, uh, even uh, ingenious concealment methods to, to smuggle contraband. And uh, when I say smuggle contraband, it's uh, thousands of containers every day through the ports. It could be drugs, it could be precursors, it could be uh, uh, cigarettes, but believe me, also the fishes in the list it's uh, included. Uh, they smuggle fish and fish uh, products. They misdescribe it. Uh, sometimes, if you wish, they even uh, launder uh, launder fish. And this is a very, uh, very lucrative and very, uh, let's say, profitable business. Uh, what the container control program uh, does, and what is the role of uh, the container control program in this uh, in this process? Uh, container control program, in fact, uh, is a joint project which is established uh, with four, uh, four pilot countries in 2004 by UNODC. Uh, you know, this is United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and uh, WCO, the World Customs Organization, with one uh, main aim. This is to try to stop, to thwart these uh, criminal activities by uh, pulling together uh, by pulling uh, together the strength of customs and other law enforcement uh, bodies. Uh, as you said later, our mission is to build operational capacity in those countries uh, which, are, which are seeking to improve uh, trade uh, security, facilitation uh, standards and controls at, uh, at uh, their borders. Uh, we develop a uh, capacity to profile, target, and uh, examine containers uh, being used in uh, being used for the transport of illicit uh, goods and including fish and uh, fish uh, products. Uh, how we how we do this? Uh, we establish and uh, maintain the so-called uh, port control units. As you say, uh, my colleague Ivan is here. He is the team leader of our port control unit in uh, uh, Dar es Salaam. It could be airports, again, it could be land borders or the so-called ACCU. This is air cargo control unit at the air. Again, uh, comprising customs and other law enforcement officials. We uh, train them, uh, we equip them to identify and inspect uh, high risky, uh, high risky shipments, uh, containers, uh, of course, lorries, trucks at the land border and air cargo parcels at the airports. Uh, 
talking uh, talking about uh, equipment which is a very uh, very costly uh, item in our budget uh, this is the right uh, moment uh, to to express our great our donor the norwegian uh, norwegian government and more precisely this is norad the norwegian agency for development cooperation for uh, their uh, generous uh, financial support to to our efforts to tackle uh, fisheries uh, fisheries crimes. Uh, of course, here I'm going to express my own uh, opinion now. But uh, fisheries crime is something uh, that uh, we in customs uh, have been neglected for for years. Uh, the term which I uh, personally used in the past, uh, which has been already mentioned, this is. Uh, IEU. You know very well the abbreviation which stands behind this. This is uh, illegal, unregulated, and unreported uh, fishing. But uh, when you say IEU, this is just a one small, uh, one small piece from the entire puzzle. Because uh, by the end of the day, it uh, turns out that these uh, Illegal fishers, they launch sometimes uh, multi-vessel fleets on lengthy, uh, on lengthy uh, voyages to practically all corners, uh, all corners of the globe. Uh, moreover, they uh, employ sophisticated and coordinated uh, strategies. Uh, Kevin already mentioned this, uh, to launder money, fish, to evade taxes. Uh, along the way, they uh, enable their activities through uh, the violation of uh, labor and sanitary and uh, in environmental standards. There is corruption, uh, bribery, and uh, and uh, uh, violence. Uh, there are cases reported from uh, our units uh, when these uh, illegal fishing uh, activities are connected to um, drugs uh, smuggling firearms smuggling and uh, uh, human trafficking, even, even slavery. Uh, in, just, uh, is in just one sentence, if I may uh, to summarize uh, this, uh, fisheries crimes uh, nowadays, this is a low risk and very high return uh, activity. It's, uh, it's a process which is driven by, by greed, uh, by weak uh, governance, uh, there is poor monitoring and enforcement, which uh, eventually is resulting in uh, overcapacity, over overfishing, and uh, diminishing uh, diminishing the the fish uh, the fish stocks. Uh, again, what we do uh, in the container control program, we are trying to to sound the alarm and to take measures because uh, this problem is uh, largely. Um, treated still as a regulatory issue, regulatory matter. And uh, this is why, uh, in my opinion, it is uh, allowed to, to flourish. Uh, minimal, minimal fines are imposed on the perpetrators when, of course, they are, uh, they are being caught or uh, there is no confiscation of fishing gear, no confiscation of uh, fishing vessels. Sometimes uh, sometimes the, the catch is uh, being confiscated or just uh, dumped uh, overboard. But uh, those guys, they're permitted to continue with their uh, illicit and, um, as I said, very, very lucrative, very profitable uh, activities. Uh, again, not uh, reiterating the previous speaker, but this is a multifaceted uh, problem. And when we confronting fisheries uh, crimes, we need to have for uh, we need to have for um, holistic holistic approach. The geographical focus. This is what we do, and uh, uh, where we are mostly active in East Asia. We have Kenya and Tanzania on the map. In West Africa, this is Benin, Ghana, and Togo. In South Asia, it's Bangladesh, the Maldives, and Sri Lanka. And Southeast Asia, uh, we have three countries there: Myanmar. Thailand and uh, Vietnam. And um, yeah, here I can go into details uh, only for uh, Myanmar, Thailand and Vietnam because I personally did, uh, the, did the trainings uh, in those uh, countries. Uh, what we see on the, what you see now on the, on the picture is uh, how we do it and uh, uh, what we do it. 
This uh, picture on the upper left corner of the screen, this is the official opening of the training in Bangkok. Uh, people from different law enforcement authorities, people from customs, people from uh, the Ministry of uh, Environment, from uh, Department of Fisheries. The lady in the middle are, is uh, the ambassador of uh, Norway uh, in Thailand, uh, Her Excellency, Madame Rotsmoen. And uh, the fact that uh, Ambassador herself came personally to uh, deliver the, uh, the welcoming words uh, to the participants, in my opinion, speaks uh, eloquently enough for the commitment and for uh, dedication on the very high, the most possible highest level to, uh, to confront this uh, phenomenon. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the next stage, practical work, usually at the end of all trainings, uh, we have uh, practical visits uh, to, to the port. This is uh, the, office of the, uh, uh, the office of the scanning operators when they are reading, where they are reading and uh, trying to interpret their uh, the images, especially now. Uh, when we are facing this uh, lockdown due to the spread of the coronavirus, more and more the customs uh, will rely on scanners and all other forms of uh, non-intrusive uh, inspection. And last but not least, uh, this is the final part, of course, of our job, uh, the, the, the physical uh, inspections. I will not uh, talk uh, much about the effect of COVID-19. Uh, there is a negative impact on all of us. I, I remember my last mission was in Vietnam uh, in March. And uh, when I returned home, uh, you know, I had the impression that the world uh, I know is falling apart in front of uh, uh, my eyes. At first, uh, uh, we are, were expecting a decrease in uh, terms of turnover. Uh, indeed, uh, there were a reduced number of containers coming to the ports, but uh, the trend with the seizure was uh, the, the, the opposite one. Less containers, much more seizure in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, quantities. And uh, of course, the lessons learned. Uh, it's obvious that uh, fisheries crimes, this is a form of uh, trans, uh, transnational organized crime rather than, as I said, a simple uh, uh, regulatory issue or. Uh, uh, compliance issue. Uh, what we try to do is to involve all key actors in the respective uh, country in this process. And also we, work, uh, we urge an increased uh, information sharing and uh, cooperation between those uh, uh, enforcement actors at uh, all levels. I mean uh, on domestic level and of course also internationally. We are trying also to uh, involve the, the civil society uh, I mentioned already that uh, during the last days uh, of our seminar, we have the non-government organization present. We have uh, representatives in the, of the private business. Uh, we try to uh, engage them, if not in the enforcement, then at least in the process of uh, uh, monitoring and uh, cooperation with the law, law enforcement uh, agencies. Uh, last but not least, this is again an example of our practical work. Uh, this is a mentorship visit in Kazakhstan. I can tell you even the date. This is the 26th of January this year, because on that day uh, when we're working on the border, the Deputy, Prime, uh, the Deputy Minister of Inferior of Kazakhstan came and, uh, you know, in an effort to uh, avoid the spread of uh, this coronavirus disease, the, the border from Kazakh side uh, was closed. Uh, this is what we usually do, uh, working with our, uh, let's say, officers uh, from the port control units, trying to identify and to select, uh, select uh, risky shipments. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the document uh, which you see on your right side of the screen, this is a railway uh, way bill. You see it's in English, it's in Chinese, it's in, in Russian. And finally, this is, the, this is the invoice. I have erased some of the information here because uh, uh, it's confidential, but you can uh, get the idea. This is container originating from uh, China. Uh, final destination, it's uh, Germany. So uh, again, you can see commercial invoice in English, in uh, Chinese, and uh, here the handwriting is in Russian. It says, uh, it says fishing, fishing gears. But it could be uh, virtually uh, everything. It could be hooks, it could be fishing rods, uh, it could be sinkers. Uh, what, uh, what happened 
when we uh, interpreted the images from the scanner, in fact, it turned out that the entire container is full of uh, fishing nets. And uh, fishing net, the fishing nets, this is our commodity which is highly regulated in the European Union because there is a ban on, uh, you know, it depends on the size of the, uh, on the, uh, the size of the meshes. So if uh, the meshes are too small, those, uh, those uh, fishing nets uh, are prohibited for introduction to the European Union. So uh, this is the idea to try to do the risk analysis at a very early stage to, uh, let's say, uh, transfer this uh, pre-arrival intel information uh, to the unit which is responsible to do the, the, the risk uh, analysis. And I really do apologize uh, that I had to uh, overspeed all the time, but uh, simply, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon? My, my internet uh, is not very good. Yeah, yeah, we, we just lost the last part of your uh, conclusion, the last couple of sentences. Okay, okay, sorry. But sorry. you're what? back now. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much, Svetlana. Thank you for the very practical presentation uh, of your work. Um, I will now move on to the third presentation uh, on the work of the UNODC Global Maritime Crime Program. Uh, the Global Maritime Crime Program is supporting member states in strengthening their criminal justice systems to better respond to maritime crimes, including fisheries crime. The program has a global focus on assisting coastal states in tackling fisheries crime by providing maritime law enforcement personnel, fisheries authorities, customs officers, and prosecutors with the skill they need to respond to fisheries crime when they encounter them at sea or in ports, and how to provide evidence for them in court. Just as police officers do not know what crimes they will come across when they go on patrol, neither do maritime law enforcement officers. So the Maritime Crime Program ensures that those who work for the maritime law enforcement agencies being supported do understand what fisheries crime is, have the means to collect evidence of it, and the skills to prevent that evidence in court. The Maritime Crime Program is mainly focused on capacity building in maritime law enforcement, including interagency cooperation in securing the best response to fisheries crime at sea. The speaker on behalf of the Global uh, maritime Crime Program is Mr. Johnny Lewis from the Seychelles Fishing Authority. Mr. Lewis has extensive knowledge of the fisheries sector with more than 15 years of experience with the Seychelles Fishing Authority, where he is currently acting as the Manager of Monitoring, Control and Surveillance. Before that, he worked as a monitoring technician and has a master's degree in fisheries policy. Mr. Lewis is chairing the Compliance Committee for the Southern Indian Ocean Fisheries Agreement. He will be speaking on the importance of interagency cooperation in tackling fisheries crime and will focus on how the Global Maritime Crime Program, with focus on visit board search and seizure, has helped strengthen interagency cooperation in the Seychelles. Johnny, the screen is yours. Um, thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, everyone. So as uh, per introduction, um, I am Johnny from the Seychelles. Um, I am the MCS manager with the Seychelles Fishing Authority. And some of the key uh, aspects of my work include uh, boarding, anyway, my team, anyway, uh, boarding at sea, um, doing joint inspections with other agencies. So um, I think just a quick word of thanks for the UNODC to extending the, um, the assistance um, to the SFA and the rest of the um, other agencies um, uh, regards to, to um, vessel boarding and, and, and related fisheries crime um, um, seminars we've had here. So I'll just quickly start my presentation. Okay, so uh, just a quick, uh, my presentation is going to be uh, real small, real short rather, uh, just a quick outline on, uh, on, uh, on uh, my presentation. So. Just a brief overview of the fisheries sector, just to put things in context. Uh, some of the fisheries crime uh, we've seen in Seychelles, um, intelligence cooperation in Seychelles, um, experience of the PBSS training and, and um, future opportunities. So uh, the, the fisheries uh, sector here is dominated by the industrial fisheries. 
Um, we have around uh, 80 vessels that is flagged in Seychelles. Um, uh, 65 um, of them are, are long line vessel and the rest are per seno vessel and support vessel. Uh, we have a smaller semi industrial fisheries um, industry who's locally owned, and, but some of the vessels are foreign crude as well. Um, and then we have um, an artisanal fishery, which is mostly small scale vessel. Now, with the industrial fishery, we also license um, up to uh, 155 to um, 170 vessels um, per year. Um, that depends on uh, on the season and 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 whatnot and other factors such as fisheries agreements. So um, the common fisheries crimes here in Seychelles, uh, we've seen a lot. I mean, we've seen a lot of illegal fishing happening. Um, and this mostly entails the poaching of um, of fish uh, from a foreign owned vessel that are not authorized to fish um, and uh, in, in recent years we've seen um, an upsurge in in, in, in um, illegal fishing um, there are not a, a lot of factors that we we suspect as to why there has been um, the subsurge in, in, in uh, illegal fishing in, in the region and, and Seychelles has been affected quite a lot. Um, we've also seen um, some fish laundering as well. It's something that is talked to a lesser extent, but we think, I mean, we feel that it's something equally important because um, at the end of the day, what is happening is that illegal fish is ending up um, um, on the market and is competing with uh, other sources of uh, of legitimate uh, fish um, and uh, all sorts of other things that is associated to it. So associated crimes with, within the fisheries sector, we've seen uh, um, it's quite common knowledge, uh, at least in the Seychelles context, that drug trafficking um, form parts of, uh, of, of, uh, of the, I mean, the bulk of drug trafficking involves fishing vessel. Um, and uh, this uh, highlights the importance of interagency cooperation. Uh, we've seen to a much smaller extent um, human trafficking and poor working condition on some of the vessels that we've interacted with. And also one of uh, some of the other things that are of concerns now within the fisheries sector is money laundering. So all of those information, all of the of these crimes. Um, I mean, if if from this, from an SFA fisheries strictly fisheries point of view, they are not immediately apparent um, until there's there's discussion with our stakeholders um, about these 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 um, incidents and uh, these infractions. I mean, if uh, the, the the one of the biggest challenges here in Seychelles, at least. Um, up to a few years ago was was the the silo way of, of, of working where everyone was working in, in their own jurisdiction and and the information sharing was not as prevalent as it is now but uh, I'll discuss this in in further details um, um, during the presentation so just a brief overview of interagency cooperation in Seychelles so we have multi agency cooperation or multilateral cooperation under the MOU that established the National Information Sharing and Coordination Center. And this um, MOU um, it basically um, sets up um, a unit, a set, uh, a, 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 an establishment that should facilitate sharing of information and uh, such as um, um, for cases I've mentioned before, um, where we suspect that fishing vessels are involved in um, in fishes other crimes, but such as drug trafficking, which is which is again um, quite prevalent. And uh, there's a number again of uh, bilateral cooperation between agencies at the moment. Um, but one thing that uh, we've seen during the capacity building activities is that there are a lot of gaps in those arrangements as well. So there is constant information sharing, but um, it's not properly defined and it's more on an ad hoc basis. Um, vessel information is shared to other law enforcement agencies. Um, but again, it's, it's, there's no sort of protocol in place at the moment 
to properly define information sharing. Uh, there has been a number of, of joint operation um, in the past with bilaterally. Um, for example, joint joint inspection with the Seychelles Coast Guard and the SFA. Uh, the SFA sharing information uh, that might be of relevance to the Drug um, um, Anti Narcotics Bureau. Um, then doing joint in, uh, investigation and inspections. Uh, we work closely with the Ministry of Environment as well because some of the um, matters fall within the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Environment, for example, um, protected species and protected areas. So, the, I mean, the, there is some, to some extent, um, um, cooperation and, and intelligence cooperation in the Seychelles, but I think one of the biggest things we've seen during the exercises are, are the number of opportunities uh, regarding how to improve um, the intelligence cooperation um, uh, within the Seychelles, within agencies that are involved in law enforcement and also involved in, in, uh, um, in the MDA, uh, maritime space. So just to share a quick experience with regards to the uh, BBSS training, um, I think it was it was a good space for I mean for the fisheries authorities to share knowledge on the fisheries. I mean we we know that there's uh, the law the, most of the um, surveillance activities uh, is done by the Seychelles Coast Guard and to some extent the maritime police. Um, but it's it, it was a great opportunity for us to share um, you know our expertise with them. For example. What are, what are the things that we look out for when we are doing boarding? And in, in a lot of cases, um, um, some of the boarding teams, some of the personnel, without proper guidance, you know, they, they, they only, there was a tendency to only focus on um, illegal fishing, which is quite prevalent. Um, but you, we, I mean, the platform that was uh, provided to us, uh, facilitated rather by the UNODC, allowed us to show the things that we, we do on a regular basis and, and in its path of, of our routine inspection. For example, um, evidence of at sea transshipments, um, which, which contributes to, to things like illegal fishing and uh, fish laundering. Um, evidence of, of, of carrying of prohibited gears, uh, prohibited species, and, and all these things were, were not being looked out for. And, and in most cases, what was happening is that there was this heavy reliance on the fisheries authority to look out for those things and, and, and share an appreciation as well um, to, the, to the work that we do on, on a regular basis um, beyond just looking out for illegal fishing and things like that. And also the, the platform also allowed um, the boarding inspectors here at the SFA to appreciate the other things that um, the other agencies are doing. I think it was a good awareness campaign for some of my guys that attended to this because again, the mentality, I mean, the mentality is, is, is working in silos. So I'm working in fisheries and I'm not really invested in what the drug enforcement agency is doing, what the environment is, is doing. What, what, what the Coast Guard is doing. And I think, I mean, after the training, there was better appreciation to the um, opportunities and um, also to, to the understanding that, look, as a fisheries officer, while my jurisdiction does not allow me to arrest someone for, for um, human trafficking, but um, uh, I, 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 I should be looking out for that. Um, uh, and uh, so, and, and drug, 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 I'm looking out for, for um, possible evidence of drug, drugs, um, smuggling and things like that. So I think it was, it was a very good opportunity for, for both all parties involved and at one point even the customs uh, and uh, got involved in the training. So it was a good opportunity for us to share our knowledge and, and appreciate uh, what the work of the other, of the other agencies are doing at an operational level, because there's a lot of effort being done um, at institutional level in regards to um, uh, agents, um, agency cooperation. But I think there was this, this space, um, this um, workshop um, allowed us to appreciate um, this uh, multi-agency cooperation at operational level. And we also noted a lot of um, opportunities as well, you know, improve, um, 
So, um, so improved information sharing, and, and we are now talking about automated information sharing um, within the other agencies. Um, while like we're doing now, it's more ad hoc basis. Um, we we appreciate the the, the um, importance more than ever for um, real time availability of real time information, um, which we've uh, we we do to some extent. But some of the other key information, for example, vessel registries and licenses and things like that, um, and also uh, management measures, because one of the things that came out in the in the in the uh, workshop was how little um, fisheries law or any other relevant laws that that involve that is um, enforced in the maritime domain is not known to other agencies. So sharing of information was a key thing that came out. Um, there was there was a more appreciation there was more appreciation to, to a holistic approach to maritime security and law enforcement. Like I've mentioned, you know, we board vessel on a regular basis. We board fishing vessel, and there are things that can be picked up. There are things that um, can be reported. For example, to, to the labor office as well. There's been a lot of talk about the um, work in uh, fishing work on fishing vessel, vessel convention, and while our jurisdiction does not extend to that, unfortunately. But there's, um, you know, there's, there's appreciation on, on, on sharing this kind of information. Human trafficking, we bought, I mean, um, Seychelles is one of the key um, ports in the Western Indian Ocean. So we should be picking up on possible human trafficking um, and um, poor working conditions. Um, there was, there was um, a key discussion on, on improving or at least codifying operating procedures within uh, between the agencies. So that's one of our key priorities, in fact, to try and establish the um, necessary operational procedures between agencies um, and also to set up the necessary information sharing protocol again. Um, we also, um, through the UNODC, um, they, we, they, they've assisted us in um, Reinitiating discussion to operationalize the coordination center has been something that we we've been trying to work on, and unfortunately not to the pace that we wanted to. Um, and one of the key um, one of the seminars that we attended, uh, well, that was um, organized by the UNODC, um, um, basically got all the stakeholders together so that we can start um, giving. The necessary momentum to this discussion, and the final realization in terms of opportunities that came out is um, the the necessity the necessity to start thinking about multifaceted approach to fisheries management and enforcement, not necessarily at domestic level, but looking beyond um, maybe at regional regional level. We know that. Um, at the international level, the IMO, the ILO, and the FAO are working on, on ways to, um, to have a uh, multifaceted approach to fisheries management, making sure that what, what, um, it's not just managing the resource, but managing the people, uh, managing uh, the safety of the vessel and things like that. So this needs to start trickling down regionally so that there's more appreciation of, of um, which again would, would be supported to a large extent by uh, multi-agency cooperation. So I think this is one of the realization that came out from some of the um, workshops that we've done. Um, and uh, so, it, I mean, it, it's, it was a real, uh, it was a real opportunity for us to start thinking on the way ahead, having a more holistic approach to uh, maritime security, including how do we deal with fisheries crimes, not just from a fisheries and um, authority point of view, but involving other agencies and also us as fisheries officers um, getting involved and having more awareness um, on other fish, other crimes that we might come across um, while working as fisheries inspectors. And, and to tell uh, uh, the viewers that there has been a lot of talk um, in the region, there has been a lot of uh, discussion around this, but uh, I think with, with the workshop, I think we've had, has put these in context for us. So there's, you know, how do we now build on that? 
and establishing it in in uh, in our work as uh, um, law enforcement agencies. So um, that being said, uh, I, like I've said, my presentation is really short. So I thank you all for listening. And again, I would like to extend my gratitude to the UNRDC for extending the invitation for uh, well for for the workshops that they've done in capacity building. Uh, we look forward for working with you guys in future. There's a lot of um, um, follow-ups that we need to do with, with some of your local uh, offices here. And uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ani, for uh, sharing uh, some of your experiences and uh, lessons learned from, from your work. Um, I would like to now um, invite all um, participants to submit uh, questions if they have any we are running a bit out of time but we're still able to to answer at least one or two questions um i see there is one uh, posted in the q a session by uh, peter um and i'm going to read it for you i think it's uh, johnny it's for you some of the training described by johnny is reminiscent of the fisheries prosecutor and interdiction training being coordinated by the caribbean regional fisheries mechanism in collaboration with the regional security system. What scope does UNODC see for supporting the sharing of experiences and lessons learned between Seychelles and the CRFM? So in the context of improving MCC in general, leading to more effective prosecution of fisheries crime and fisheries related crimes. Uh, Johnny, floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Peter, for this uh, question. I think this is a very good one because in most in most cases a lot of in a lot of cases what we've seen is is the exchanges happens within within region where context is more or less similar but there's there's no um, uh, there's no other exchanges that you know for example like this is a good question I mean a good proposal um, uh, for exchanges possibly with um, in the Caribbean because this is a very I mean it will ha ha we can then compare the differences um, in in practices in MCS um, and uh, in between the, this region not just Seychelles but this region and and the Caribbean region which I think would be very very useful and and um, if the UNODC um, wishes to support that then this would be much welcome. But uh, I think this is this is a very good uh, proposal and uh, it should be looked at um, if, I mean, now with, with today's technology, we can do that without traveling. So I think that's a, that's a very good uh, proposal. And, and, and if, if UNODC sees to support this, then uh, uh, we should be up for it. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. Um, I, I see there are at the moment no other questions in the chat uh, and we are uh, already 10 minutes over time. Uh, I therefore would like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers for providing such hands-on experience on the different forms of technical assistance that uh, UNODC provides, um, also on the needs of such assistance and, uh, and the impact that these activities have. Um, Thank you to the co-hosts uh, of the Blue Justice Conference for, for a successful meeting. Take this opportunity because this is the last webinar. Uh, the Government of Norway, UNDP, and the North Atlantic Fisheries Intelligence Group. It's very important that we join forces in uh, maintaining a momentum on this important issue despite the very challenging uh, circumstances. Um, and uh, our gratitude to, to our donors for making our work possible. Uh, the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation for the FishNet program implemented by the Global Program for Combating Wildlife and Forest Crime and the Container Control Program, um, as well as the Government of Japan and the U.S. Department of State Bureau of Ocean, International Environmental and Scientific Affairs for supporting the work implemented by the Global Maritime Crime Program. Uh, thanks to all the participants for joining us uh, this Friday afternoon and uh, wishing you a nice day and a good weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.